In this video, I'm gonna show you step-by-step step how to set up Pi-hole on a Raspberry Pi in order to provide network-wide ad and malware blocking for your client devices. And I've also created the world's greatest Pi-hole tutorial in order to make your life easier. All right, let's get started. Welcome to Crosstalk Solutions. My name's Chris and this is a Raspberry Pi. It's a single board computer that can be used for all sorts of fun projects, including Pi-hole, which is a network-wide ad and malware blocker that I've been using in my own network for four or five years now. It's a really great example of where a Raspberry Pi project can be incredibly useful as a specialized server running in your home or business environment. But how can you get up and running with Pi-hole and once it's up, what's the best configuration? Well. I have created a full detailed tutorial that covers everything that I'm gonna talk about in this video and more. So check the link in the description and you'll be able to follow along with this video, copy and paste all of the commands, as well as directly click on any resource links that you're gonna to need to set up and test your pie hole. Now statistics show that only 75% of the folks watching this channel are actually subscribed to Crosstalk Solutions. So if you found this tutorial helpful and you'd like to keep up to date with everything that we've got going on here on YouTube, make sure to hit that subscribe button down below. It's one of the best ways that you can help the channel and best of all, it's absolutely free. I can already hear the comments on this video complaining about how it's impossible to get your hands on a Raspberry Pi these days. And really you're not wrong about that. So to head off any of the complainers, let me point out two things. First of all, Pi-hole doesn't have to run on a Raspberry Pi. The instructions in this tutorial are gonna work just as well if you install Pi-hole onto a virtual machine or into a Docker container. So if you really want a Pi-hole, but you can't get your hands on a Raspberry Pi, don't let that be the roadblock. I mean, I've considered many times moving my own Pi-hole servers off onto virtual machines, if for no other reason than to free up some Raspberry Pis that I can use for other projects. Second, there's an excellent resource for finding Raspberry Pis when they do come in stock. Follow rpylocator on Twitter or keep an eye on their webpage at rpylocator.com. You can set filters for the pies that you want, your location, and then that webpage will actively ding you when what you want comes into stock. Or in other words, don't complain, use your brain and definitely don't buy a pie from a scalper. It's not worth it. I just got this Raspberry Pi 4 8 gigabyte a few weeks ago using our Pi locator. Super easy. Let's hop into the tutorial. Here is what you need to get started. First of all, a Raspberry Pi. Doesn't have to be any sort of super powerful model. Even an older generation Pi is gonna work just fine. This project, the Pi hole project is not resource intensive like at all. I'm gonna be installing Pi hole onto a Raspberry Pi 4 2 gigabyte model. And even that is like way overkill for this use case. Now, as I said earlier, you don't really even need a Raspberry Pi as Pi-hole can be installed in a Docker container or on a virtual machine. Uh, in the blog post, there's a link to all of the supported operating systems that you can use. Uh, if you do go with a Raspberry Pi though, you are gonna need a micro SD card. It doesn't have to have a ton of space, even an eight gigabyte card is gonna work fine, but I would highly recommend a higher quality card since this is gonna be in a Raspberry Pi functioning as a server that's running all the time. And you don't want like a crappy micro SD card failure to be the reason why you can't watch the Golden Girls on Hulu. Finally, you're gonna need to download the Raspberry Pi Imager. The link is in the blog post. The Raspberry Pi Imager is the easiest way to format and install the Raspberry Pi OS onto your micro SD card, and it works with Windows, Mac OS, and Ubuntu. I'm gonna be moving pretty fast through this tutorial, so two things that can help you out. Number one, follow along with the blog post. Link is in the description below. That way you can go step by step. You can pause this video if you need to, but also I'm gonna have full time codes down in the description. So use the time codes, use the blog post, and that way in the interest of time, the video can be made uh, quite a bit shorter here. All right, so from my desktop, we have the Raspberry Pi Imager. Uh, link to download it is in the blog post. We wanna start off by choosing our operating system. So we're gonna say choose OS, Raspberry Pi OS Other, and then we wanna scroll down to Raspberry Pi OS Lite 64-bit. Then we need to pick our micro SD card as the destination for this Raspberry Pi OS. Uh, make sure that you pick the right one here because if you don't, uh, you could potentially overwrite some stuff that you don't wanna overwrite. So I know that mine is a 32 gig card, so it's this one right here. Uh, but before you hit write, 
there are some things that we want to do in the settings over here. So click the gear icon. Let's give it a host name. I'm going to call mine Pihole 3. Uh, since this is the third Pi hole that I'm adding into my network here. Then we want to enable SSH. Uh, password authentication is perfectly fine. Scroll down to set username and password and set a strong password for the Pi user. Then you can scroll all the way to the bottom and check this box for set locale settings. Uh, mine is set to Los Angeles as well as US keyboard layout, but set yours to what works for your uh, geographic location and keyboard layout. All right, save that. And now we can click right to push all of this onto that micro SD card. And there it goes. Now the writing to the micro SD card doesn't take too long. It takes about, uh, you know, three, four minutes. And then once that's done, pull out the micro SD card, pop it into your Raspberry Pi, and then power it up. While we're talking about powering up the Raspberry Pi, I highly recommend getting one of these uh, Pi switches from Kanakit. Um, they're very, very handy, especially when you are working with a Pi a lot and you're rebooting it a lot, you're turning it on and off a lot. It's much um, easier on the Pi to have a button to turn it on and off than it is to be plugging and unplugging you know, the, the tiny USB-C cable uh, in the case of the Raspberry Pi 4. So definitely uh, consider picking one of these up and there is a link in the blog post. Once you've plugged the micro SD card into the Raspberry Pi and booted it up, it should take about two minutes before you see it online. The first thing we need to do is figure out what IP address it was given on our network. I should also mention that you want to make sure you are plugging this into the Ethernet port and not relying on the wireless capabilities of the Raspberry Pi. You definitely want it to be hardwired into your network. One of the easiest ways to find the IP address of your brand new Pi hole is to look at the DHCP lease table from your router. So in my example here, I have an edge router four and I can see that Pi hole three was given the IP address 192.168.200.182. Very likely your DHCP server is gonna have this ability as well, where you can look at the leases that have been given to clients and then usually just sort by the expiration date and you'll see which ones were given out most recently. If you don't have a way to check the DHCP lease table to see which IP address the Pi was given, you can always hook up a keyboard and monitor and then just run like IPA uh, and then get the IP address that way. All of that information is in the blog post, uh, go check that out. So since I'm at 192.168.200.182, I want to now open up a PuTTY session and get to that IP address. So I'm gonna put it right in here, 192.168.200.182, accept and we're gonna log in as Pi, and then the password that you set up during the Raspberry Pi imager. Okay, so we are logged into our Pi hole. Uh, full instructions on the blog post how to do this in Windows command line as well as Mac OS terminal. So I'm using PuTTY, but you can SSH into this uh, whichever way you find easiest. The first thing that we wanna do is update the Raspberry Pi. So we're gonna do that with sudo apt update and and to run a second command, sudo apt upgrade dash Y. We're going to let this run. The initial update of the Raspberry Pi is going to take about three or four minutes. Once the Raspberry Pi has been updated, we need to give it a static IP address. There are two different ways that we can do this. The first way is to set a DHCP reservation, meaning that if the IP address that was passed to the Pi by DHCP is acceptable to you, then you can just tell your DHCP server, hey, for this Raspberry Pi, only ever give it this IP address and don't give this IP address to any other device ever. In my Edge Router 4, for instance, I can click Map Static IP and then we can simply just say Save and now that DHCP reservation is set. The second way that you can do it is to set an IP address uh, statically on the Raspberry Pi itself, which is what we're going to do next. So we need to edit a file called dhcpcd.conf, and we're going to do that by saying sudo nano-w etsy dhcpcd.conf. Now in this file, we want to scroll down here until we find the section that says example static IP configuration. Now here, we just need to comment out the lines that we want to modify for our static settings. In this case, interface ETH0, static IP address that I'm gonna give my Raspberry Pi is 192.168.200.52. 
Now, 192.168.200 is my subnet, right? You're gonna wanna pick an IP address that is in your subnet. So for instance, if you are 192.168.1.x, you're gonna wanna make sure that you choose an IP address in that range, and the IP address that you choose should be outside of the DHCP pool of addresses that are automatically handed out to clients when they connect to your network. So you should have a separate range of IP addresses that aren't gonna be handed out by DHCP. Pick one of those IP addresses for the static IP address for your Pi. You also wanna give it the static router. In my case, my gateway, which is 200.1. And then let's give it some additional name servers. I'll give it 200.1 and we will choose 1.1.1.1. This is all IPv6 stuff that I'm not using, so I'm gonna get rid of the IPv6 DNS server. All right, once that's done, you can hit Control X followed by yes and enter to save that file, and now reboot the Raspberry Pi with sudo reboot. Once your Raspberry Pi has been rebooted, reconnect to the new IP address that you just gave it, and then we're gonna actually install Pi-hole now. So you can see the command to install Pi-hole right here in the blog post. We're gonna copy that. And then in the Raspberry Pi, we're gonna do shift insert. That's how you can paste uh, with putty. You can also just right click. So we're gonna say enter. And this is gonna fire off the Raspberry Pi installation wizard, which again, I go through in great detail in the blog post. I'm gonna brush through it really quickly here because a lot of it is just pressing okay, okay, okay. By the way, apologies for any background noise. For some reason, my neighbor's gardeners know exactly when I'm recording videos and that's when they pull out the big leaf blowers. Here we go, Pi Hole Automated Installer. This installer will transform your device into a network-wide ad blocker. Pi Hole is free, but powered by your donations. So I strongly urge everyone, if you get a lot out of this Pi Hole project, send them a few bucks. Pi Hole is a server. This is saying, hey, you need a static IP address for this. We already have one, so we're gonna say continue. And then we're gonna choose these values, right? So 200.52 is the static IP address that I picked. Now, if you see something that is not the static IP address that you picked, you probably forgot to reboot the Pi. So I would reboot it and then try to launch the installation again. In this case, we're gonna say continue. It's possible your router could see blah, 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 some information about IP conflict, doesn't matter, we'll say okay. And then we are going to pick our upstream DNS provider. So this is basically saying when we don't know the information about a DNS request or a DNS lookup that you've sent to us, we're going to send that to these upstream providers, right? So for instance, if you go to, you know, girlswithhairyarmpits.com, it's going to say, hey, I don't know where to find girlswithhairyarmpits.com. So let's try Cloudflare and see if Cloudflare knows where that is, right? Now, later in this tutorial, we are going to be setting up our own unbound server, which is going to directly query the root DNS servers on the internet rather than sending those requests to a third party. So it doesn't really matter what you pick here because we're gonna be changing it anyways, which again is a privacy thing. One additional thing I wanna say about the DNS server selections, like you don't have to use Unbound, right? You don't have to go through this full tutorial and do lookups directly to the root DNS servers on the internet if you don't want to. However, if you're not gonna do Unbound, I highly suggest clicking here and checking out this article that they have about upstream DNS providers uh, at, in the PyHole documentation because some of these providers will just take any request, send it through, and then give you the IP address that you need to connect to, whereas some of them do have content filtering built in already. So for instance, if you pick OpenDNS, OpenDNS has some built-in content uh, filtering where you can block out pornography or tasteless stuff or sexuality, sexual categories, things like that. Cloudflare also has some level of uh, filtering on their lookups, but you maybe don't want to use 1.1.1.1 in this case. Uh, if you want to do malware blocking, for instance, you can use 1.1.1.2. If you want to block both malware and adult content, it's 1.1.1.3. And those you would have to put in as custom entries in your upstream DNS provider settings. So take a look through this page that I have linked in that blog post. And if you're not going to use Unbound, uh, pick one of these that you think is going to work best for your environment. All right, back to the pie hole. We're gonna pick Cloudflare for now. And then this says pie hole relies on third party block lists. Do we want to import the default block list, which is Stephen Black's unified 
hosts list. We're going to say yes to that and we're going to talk about the block list a little bit more later in this tutorial. For now, we'll just say yes. Do you want to install the admin web interface? Of course we do because we want to be able to configure the pie hole. So we'll say yes. Uh, and then yes again, would you like to enable query logging? We'll say yes. And then what level of query logging, right? Are we going to hide the domains that we're searching? Are we going to be completely anonymous? Are we going to show everything? For the purposes of this tutorial, we're just going to say show everything and hit continue. And now Pi-hole is going to be actually installed and we should get one more summary screen at the end. Okay, our Pi-hole installation is complete and the summary screen gives us the admin login information as well as the password that it sets by default, but we want to set our own password for Pi-hole. So we're going to do that next. We're going to say Pi-hole-a-p and then it's going to ask us to enter and then confirm a password. Make sure this is a strong password that you're not going to forget. Okay, since that's done, we can now log into the Pi-hole GUI. So that's going to be HTTP colon slash slash the IP address of your Pi-hole slash admin. And when you get to the admin screen, just pop in the password that we just set and then click log in. So here is the Pi-hole web interface. Let's quickly go over what we're seeing here. Up across the top, we have our statistics, right? I already have my computer set to use this Pi-hole, which is why we're already seeing some statistics. Uh, but you might see nothing here until you actually put the pie hole into use, which we're going to do a little bit later in the tutorial. But here we have the total queries that have been sent to this pie hole, how many queries have been blocked by pie hole, and then the percentage blocked. And then we have how many domains are in our block list. Right now it's about 158,000 different domains that pie hole is actively blocking. Going down the left hand menu here, this is the dashboard. Query log shows us what DNS requests have been coming into the pie hole and then the long term data allows us to dig in even deeper into those DNS queries and filter out on like what was blocked and what wasn't and certain dates and all that sort of good stuff. Now groups and clients are pretty interesting. This allows you to utilize Pi-hole to, to perform different functions. So for instance, if you want a group of IP addresses that you don't want to have Pi-hole block, you can basically put those in a group and then tell that group, hey, don't block um, you know, anything that's in this group or vice versa. You can have it so that you only block uh, with Pi-hole particular um, clients that are in a specific group, right? So there's a lot of powerful stuff you can do with groups and clients. It's beyond the scope of this tutorial, but check that out in their documentation if that's something that you're interested in. When we click on domains, this gives us the option of whitelisting or blacklisting particular domains, right? So if we want, if something's getting blocked and we don't want to be blocked, we can come in here and add it to a whitelist. That way Pi-hole will ignore that domain as far as, you know, any requests that are sent to it. Uh, just like if there's something that is getting through that we want to have blocked, right? Girlswithhairyarmpits.com is not on a block list. By the way, I don't know if that is an actual real domain name or not. I, I urge you not to look into that. But if that domain is not on a block list, we can add it here and specifically block it for any requests that come from our network. All right, clicking on add list, this gives us the option to add new ad list block list basically and you can block on different things right by default the Stephen Black block list that comes in here is pretty good and it's got according to the dashboard about 158,000 blocked domains but it's for ads right there's also different blockers for malware there's different blockers for tracking and telemetry there's different blocking for adult content so where do you find different block lists that we can add to this list so going back to the blog post, if we see this sort of uh, lime green section that I've got right here, there's this article right here that says the best pie hole block list. If we open that, here we can see a lot of information about various block lists, including something that's super important, which is more is not always better. I strongly believe in this because if you lock your network down too far, uh, you're going to have your whole family complaining to you about, hey, I can't get to this, I can't do shopping, I can't get to that, and it just becomes more hassle than it's absolutely worth, and you're just going to end up disabling Pi-hole in the long run. So what you really want to find is enough lists that blocks all the bad stuff and ads that you want to block, but is still, uh, you know, still allows you to use the internet without, you know, getting just blocked everywhere and stopped and having all sorts of issues. 
So one of the articles that's uh, linked in this article is the fire bog, right? So this is where I pull my block list. If we open up the fire bog, this is a great resource, right? Because this says, here's a whole bunch of maintained lists. The ones that aren't maintained are sort of X'd out down here or they have a strike through in them. Uh, and then they're either green or blue. Now green means these are lists that are well maintained and they allow for standard internet traffic. They're not really going to slow you down or block things that you don't want to block, but it's definitely going to block malicious stuff, right? And they've got all these different categories, suspicious, advertising, tracking and telemetry, and then malicious and other, right? So what I typically like to do is I will take one or two of these lists out of each category. So let's say the top two lists in each of these, I will just grab this, copy it, go over to my pie hole, paste it right here and click add. And then I'm going to repeat that and basically take the top two from each of these categories. And then once I've got that done, I will show you how to actually apply these block lists. All right, so there we can see I've now got a good number of block lists added to my pie hole. Again, how many you do is up to you, but my recommendation would be at least just stick to the ones that are in green on the fire bog. That way you know they're not going to block too much stuff and be too intrusive into the you know normal web surfing that you're doing. Once you have all those lists in, we need to come over here to tools and then click on this update gravity button. And what this is gonna do when we click update is it's gonna go through all of our block lists and it's just gonna refresh all of the information, right? So basically, how many domains are in that list? Let's add those domains to our um, you know, list of block domains that the pie hole is uh, blocking uh, based on. Once update gravity is done, we're gonna see this success at the top. And now if we go to the dashboard, look, now we're blocking on 221,000 active domains, whereas before we were blocking on like 158,000. So adding all those in definitely increased this by about, I don't know, 30% or so. And uh, now we have uh, much better blocking, including some more of the malicious and tracking and telemetry stuff. All right, going back to our left-hand menu, the next item here is disable blocking. Now, if there's ever a situation where, you know, someone in your family comes up to you and they're like, hey, I'm having trouble getting to this, you know, I can't shop on Amazon or I can't shop on this or that, or, you know, I'm having trouble loading something on Plex or Hulu or Netflix, whatever the case may be. The first thing that you usually want to try is disable blocking for like, you know, five minutes, for instance, and then go try that thing again. And if it works after you've disabled blocking, that means that the pie hole is blocking something that it's not supposed to. So then you can go into the logs, see the actual domains that were being blocked, and then you can whitelist what you need to get done what you need to get done. Now the problem with disabling blocking, besides the fact that it actually disables blocking for whatever period of time, is that it's kind of a pain, right? If you're like, hey, I need to disable blocking, you have to now log into the admin portal of your pie hole, go down to disable blocking, and then click for five minutes or click for however long, right? Which is not too bad, but if you have to do it on a regular basis, like I found myself logging in, you know, once or twice a week to hit the disable blocking button, and I've got multiple pie holes. So I had to log into one, hit the button, log into the other, hit the button. It just takes a lot of time. That can all be scripted. So if you come over to the blog post here, we can see that you can create an HTTP string uh, with the amount of time that you want to disable as well as your password hash, which you can find uh, right here. There's another command that gets you your password hash. And then you can either just bookmark this URL in your browser and you know click on it whenever you want to disable the pie hole for five minutes. Uh, or you can use it in some other type of scripting. Like you can, I've seen people that have scripted it into Home Assistant. So they've got a button on their Home Assistant dashboard that disables Pi Hole for however long. Uh, me personally, I have it on my Stream Deck. So I've got a button on my Stream Deck that when I press the button, it uh, disables it on my first Pi Hole, 
pauses for one second, then disables it on my second pile. So it's like one button that does both of the disables across both of my servers. It's super, super handy to have that set up. So definitely check that out. It's kind of like an extra side project on top of the pie hole configuration that we're doing, but highly, highly recommended. Going back to our left-hand menu, we next have local DNS. This allows you, I mean, since pie hole is a DNS server, this allows you to populate some local DNS names that when your clients do a search for a particular FQDN, if there's an entry in this local DNS record, you can affect which IP address is actually given to that client when they request it. So like if you have a local, you know, network attached storage or something, maybe you want to give it an FQDN so that when your clients search for it, it'll go to the local LAN rather than out to the internet to try to find a WAN IP address. And then under tools, there's a whole bunch of different tools that you can take a look at. The one that I use most often is this update gravity. Every so often I go in there just to refresh the block lists. Next we have settings. All right, so let's spend some time on settings. The system tab basically just shows us information about the pie hole, your resource utilization and stuff like that. Notice that, you know, with my pie hole four or my Raspberry Pi four, two gigabyte, uh, right now with pie hole running, I'm, get, I'm using 0.4% of the CPU and 0.3% of the RAM. So when I tell you that pie hole can really be installed on a much older Raspberry Pi with very few resources, it absolutely can. Down here at the bottom, we have some various buttons for restarting, powering off, flushing DNS cache, things like that. The DNS tab, uh, this is where we set our upstream DNS provider. Now we're gonna be changing this in a little bit after we install Unbound, but right now we can see the Cloudflare DNS servers that I picked are already in here. Now, if you're not gonna use Unbound, you can do something like, hey, use Cloudflare for the first resolver, but use you know Google for the second resolver. You can kind of split these up. You can even give custom upstream DNS servers, such as the ones that are given to you by your local ISP if you want. The other setting that you want to look out for in the DNS tab is this one right here. So the interface setting. Now in my network, I have three different subnets. I have my LAN, I have in a guest network, and I have an IoT network. And all three of those look to these pie hole servers for their DNS queries, which means that I have to allow queries coming in from different subnets, right? So by default, that is not allowed. It says only allow local requests, okay? okay? So what you wanna do is just pick a different one down here. I'm gonna pick respond only on interface ETH0, which means you can resolve any DNS requests that come into ETH0, um, but you know, if it comes in by anything else, which there really isn't anything else, but if it comes in any other way, just ignore it. So scroll down and make sure you hit save if you made any changes there. Next, the DHCP tab is a DHCP server. So the pie hole can function as a DHCP server in your network. I've never set it up that way, so we are going to skip this tab. If we click on the API slash web interface tab, um, this is mostly used for the various web interface settings. So the light theme, the dark theme, and you can even choose the Star Trek L cars theme. Let's go ahead and change to that. And now we can see that our pie hole looks like, uh, you know, a computer screen out of the classic Star Wars uh, TV series. All right, if we click on the privacy tab, this just allows us to specify the level of logging or, or how much an anonymity, an anonymity, how anonymous we are when we're making these DNS requests. Like, what are we actually saving? Uh, remember in the wizard, we pick show everything. So I'm just going to leave it there. Then if we click teleporter, this allows us to back up all of our settings, including our whitelist, blacklist, clients, groups, uh, block lists, and it allows us to back those up and then restore them onto a different pie if we want. So that's for safekeeping if we've done a lot of configuration changes to this pie hole. But it's also useful if you set up one pie hole, get all the settings dialed in the way that you want, back up those settings, and then install them onto a second pie hole to sort of keep those in sync. All right, so the next thing that we need to do, since Pi-hole is now fully configured the way that we want it, I mean, we haven't done Unbound yet, but we're gonna get to that, is we need to tell our clients to use the Pi-hole. Now, there's a couple of ways that we can do this. You can set all of your clients manually. That's a super pain in the butt, but let me show you how to do it. In Windows, for instance, I can open Network and Internet Settings. Then I can say Change Adapter Options. Pick one of my Ethernet adapters, such as this 10 gig adapter I've got in this PC, double click on IPv4, and then here we can say 
uh, you know, I have it fully set statically, but you might be on DHCP where it looks like this, where all of your information is uh, provided to the computer automatically. You can change the bottom box down here to only use the following DNS servers and say 192.168.200. You know, 52 in my case is the IP address of my pie hole, and then just hit OK. I'm not going to do that though, because we're going to be smart about the way that we hand out our DNS. Uh, uh, servers and we're going to do it with our DHCP server or dynamic host control protocol server. So for my network and for most networks out there, typically DHCP runs on the router slash firewall device that you have in place. Uh, mine is running on my edge router four. If I click on details, here we can see my DNS settings. So this is basically what information are we handing out to new clients that connect to our network. So if it's an iPhone hitting your wireless or a Roku that you're plugging into an ethernet port so that you can get you know, streaming television, whatever the device might be, it first looks to your DHCP server and says, hey, give me an IP address. And your DHCP server says, here's your IP address. Also, here's your DNS settings and here's whatever else, you know, other settings you need. So in my case, we can see that DNS one I'm handing out is the IP address of this brand new pie hole that I'm setting up. And then the second DNS server is a second pie hole that I already have set up. So once you give the DNS settings to DHCP, uh, that's it. You save those settings. And then when new clients connect, now they're going to get the IP address of your pie hole for DNS. Now, one more thing that I do need to mention here, since we're talking about firewall, is if you have savvy users or if you have you know teenage kids that know a thing or two about computers the way that this is set up by default they would be able to take their you know tablet or their iphone or whatever go into their network settings and manually set a different dns server they can change it to you know 1.1.1.1 and they can completely bypass your pie hole if they want to right so Something that I would suggest doing if you're going to have a pie hole in your network is set up your firewall rules such that DNS queries are allowed to the IP addresses of your pie holes, but they're blocked for any other IP address, whether it's an internet IP address or another local LAN IP address on port 53. That's something that you can do with firewall rules. It's beyond the scope of this documentation because everyone's got a whole bunch of different firewalls out there, but I would suggest locking down your DNS so that your pie holes are the only resolvers you're allowing on your network. All right, so once your devices are using the pie hole, you should start seeing information get populated into the dashboard. So you can see now I've got 3,300 queries, 78 blocked. We see some graphs and statistics starting to pop up here and we can see, you know, topped blocked clients, topped blocked domains, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we're starting to get some information and pie hole is now doing its job, which is absolutely wonderful. That's exactly what we wanna see. However, when a DNS request comes into Pi-hole right now, and it says, hey, I don't know how to resolve this one, we're currently sending it to an upstream DNS provider. Remember, we selected Cloudflare during the initial setup wizard. Now, Cloudflare is a DNS provider that doesn't log any of its queries, like they specifically are more secure in that way or more pr privacy conscious in that way where they don't um, you know, log any of the requests. Like if an IP address, you know, connects out and says, you know, hey, I'm looking for girlswithhairyarmpits.com, uh, Cloudflare does not keep your IP address associated with that DNS lookup, right? So it, it does not save any of that information. But some DNS servers do save all those queries, right? So then there's a trail from your WAN IP address to whatever domains that you're looking up. Uh, so to be more private, what you can do is set up a service called Unbound. And what Unbound is going to do is not rely on any upstream DNS providers. You're going to use the pie hole and the Unbound service itself to perform lookups to the root DNS servers out on the internet, right? So it's basically saying, hey, we are going to be completely self-sufficient here and not rely on any other service or DNS server out there. So let's go ahead and set up Unbound next. It's super, super easy. I'm gonna grab the installation command right here and copy that and SSH back into the pie hole. And we're gonna run the Unbound installation command. Should just take about 20, 30 seconds at the most. And now we need to set up a configuration file, right? So here's the configuration file, etc unbound, unbound.conf.d slash pieholeconf this file does not exist yet. So we need to create it and to create it, we can just edit that file name and that will also create it at the same time. 
So if I paste that in there, we can see I'm now editing this new file called pihole.conf uh, in this folder. What we wanna paste in here is all of this information that I have in the blog post. Um, there's also a link to where you can download this information from the Raspberry Pi, uh, or excuse me, from the Pi Hole documentation online. If for some reason my copy paste doesn't work for you, uh, you can just click this link here and get it directly from uh, the Pi Hole documentation. So I'm gonna copy all of this, and then we're gonna shift insert to paste it in here. Uh, kind of make sure that it looks good by scrolling up. Yeah, everything looks like it did come in here pretty well. And notice that Unbound is going to resolve on 127.0.0.1, which is the local host IP address of our Pi Hole or of any device. And then it's gonna do those, res uh, those lookups on port 5335. All right, so exit and save that. And now we need to start up the Unbound service, uh, which we're gonna do with this command here. So copy. Shift insert, and we can see that we have restarted unbound, but let's check to make sure that it's running. We're gonna do sudo service unbound status. And what we should see is this green active running right there so that we know unbound is working. But let's test it. We need to test it against some queries. So we can use the dig command for that. So let me clear this out. If we say dig crosstalksolutions.com at 127.0.0.1, meaning using 127.0.0.1 as the server that we're doing the lookup against, and then dash P for port 5335. We can see here that the status was no error, and we got an IP address back for crosstalksolutions.com. So everything seems like it's working just fine when we do a lookup through our local unbound service. So that's great, I'm glad everything's working, but we're not using it with the Pi Hole yet. Now we need to tell Pi Hole, hey, use the local unbound service when you do root lookups or when you have a DNS query that you don't have the answer to that query already cached in your database. So to do that, we're gonna go back to our Pi Hole. Let's click on settings. We're gonna click on uh, DNS and then we're gonna uncheck the two upstream providers that we have checked currently, and we're gonna do a custom one. And the custom one is going to be 127.0.0.1 hashtag or pound sign 5335. That's basically saying this IP address pound this port number. And then scroll down to the bottom and click save. And there we go. Our Pi Hole is now doing its own lookups to the root domain DNS servers out on the internet. So now how can we test out the ad blocking of our Pi Hole? Well, there is a really easy way to do that. If you click this link here under testing ad blocking, uh, we're gonna come to this website here and we can see that it just ran um, with my computer here, which is using this new Pi Hole as its DNS server. And we can see that we blocked 93% of hosts. Now let's t turn off the Pi Hole, right? Let's take it off of there. So I'm gonna change my adapter options and we're gonna say, instead of the pie hole, let's use like 8.8.8.8, uh, .8 .8 .8, which is Google's DNS servers. We're gonna say, okay, okay. And then let's run that test again, control F5, and let's see what it comes up with now. So without the pie hole, and just using the def like 8.8.8 .8 Google domain servers, we are only blocking 61% of the tests that um, this website tests against. So definitely a big difference there. If you scroll down, you can see what is blocked and what is not blocked. So yeah, I, I very quickly wanna get back to using the pie hole here because I don't want all of that stuff tracking me. I don't wanna be served ads from all these different places. So we're gonna get right back to our pie hole. All right, the last thing that you may need to know about pie hole is how to update it. Every so often they're gonna come out with new versions and whatnot, so very simple, just do sudo pihole-up, and that is going to reach out, see if there are any new updates for pihole, and it will apply those updates. You can also maybe set like a cron job to do this command like once a month or something, that should be totally fine. So you are now fully up and running with Pihole and Unbound. Remember to check the blog post for all of these step-by-step -step instructions. If you are happy with Pihole and you really like the project and the work that those developers have done, make sure you donate 
a uh, few bucks goes a long way towards helping the good work that they're doing. And if you like this tutorial and you're looking to support Crosstalk Solutions, well, there's a couple things you can do. You can buy me a beer with the link there, or you can check out the Crosstalk store for all of the latest merch and uh, some really cool t-shirts and stickers and stuff like that. Anything helps Crosstalk Solutions keep making these videos for you. All right, thank you guys so much for watching and check out these videos on the side that I've handpicked for you to watch next.